Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll talk about our national forests with the executive team at the National Forest Foundation. Our guests are Mary Mitzos, President and CEO, Executive Vice President Ray Foote, and Vice President Marcus Selig. So thank you all for joining us. You know, this, this is a really interesting topic because we're in a situation where we are diverted by pandemic, by economic dislocation, by political, uh, uh, by political season where we have uh, the US presidential elections. Why in this environment where we have so much to care about, where we are traumatized by so much, should we be caring about our national forests? Mary? You care to take a shot at that? I'd love to take a shot at that, Mark. Thank you so much for inviting us to participate today. Um, I think the public needs to care about our national forests. It's, it's, it's an unknown asset to many. And uh, forests clean our water, they clean our air, they provide wildlife habitat, they provide solace and recreation for people who can get outside, especially during a pandemic. And it is uh, one of the greatest public assets that the United States has. So you as a citizen are part owner in 193 million acres across the country. So that, that's really interesting. So you're saying that the forests act as a filtration system yes. for our air and for our water. Correct. So, so if it's a filtration system for our air and water, then what happens if the forests start to disappear? And we're seeing that in the Amazon, we're seeing that with the burning that goes across the West. I'm going to go over to Marcus next and I'll come back to you, Ray. Um, but what happens, Marcus, if, if the forests start to diminish uh, here in the United States? Uh, can't we, through our technology, through uh, direct filtration of water or some other way uh, replace that and then use the land for, for other purposes, farming, for example? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And, um, you know, un unfortunately, we're getting to see it at some small scales as, as we do lose our forests to, to extreme wildfire. Um, and when we have that, we, we see a couple things happen. Uh, so one is we, we do lose this carbon um, sink Instead of, instead of gathering carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we lose that um, if the trees don't regrow. Once they start regrowing and we can do some replanting, we can, we can help rebuild the forest. But in the interim, we're losing that, that carbon sink, which is incredibly important from a, a climate change standpoint. From a water standpoint, uh, when we lose these forests, we see incredible post-fire flooding and the effects it has downstream, not only for habitat, but for water intakes for municipal governments um, is, is extreme as well. Um, huge amounts of sedimentation, loss of infrastructure as pipes and, um, sometimes even wash away. They, we can't keep up um, with what the green infrastructure uh, provides. And so we can't engineer around it. And then when we try to, the cost is exorbitant. It's much cheaper to protect our green infrastructure, protect our water filters and our water sources than it is to address it on the back end after we lose them. So that's really interesting. If we take, let, let's take two different cities. Let's take New York, which famously is supplied by the Catskills uh, water infrastructure. And you take uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles, which has the LA River uh, running through it, which looks like a concrete culvert, except at times when there's flooding, in which case it has to move an enormous amount of water through urban environments. So uh, Ray, when you're, when you're looking at, the, at this point of why we should care, and, and let's take someone who lives within a concrete environment of these cities. Um, I think what Marcus is saying is that actually the water supply infrastructure of both of those cities is actually, the forests are part of the engineering that we have neglected that supply uh, water and uh, ecosystems that allow these urban environments to even exist. Is that, is, that, is that how you see it as well? Yeah, no, that's well said, Mark. And just to build a little bit on that and what Marcus and Mary said, um, 
you know, I live in Washington, D.C. So even though many would say that Washington is a very green city, um, some would say it's a very swampy city, um, there is a real, um, there is a really um, sort of engineering, technical, and even really philosophical difference in what we call green engineering and gray engineering, you know, green infrastructure and gray infrastructure. And what Marcus talked about is that resilient, soft, always changing green infrastructure. The a key difference is, um, I mean, gray infrastructure is pipes and beams and pumps, and it's stuff that we create, and it is welded in place and fixed in place. It doesn't adapt. It's not resilient. It is what it is until it breaks, and then it has to be fixed at extremely high cost. Green infrastructure, our forests, are these amazing, living, changing things. And when there are scars to the land, over time they heal, and their ecosystem function returns, so they can filter water. You know, they can catch the snow, hold it, release it slowly, so that as trees begin to grow, they hit those peak carbon absorption rates. You know, in the early and mid years. So. There's just a real big difference in gray and green. And the National Forest at 193 million acres are really a centerpiece of this country's green infrastructure. And beyond just kind of the, the um, kind of tangible count of water and air benefits, you know, Mary touched on recreation. 170 million Americans each year get out and have fun on national forest lands hiking, skiing, biking, camping, bird watching, hunting, fishing, you name it. So another reason to care is about this very human interface where millions of Americans um, are out having fun. And also, by the way, spending 13 to $15 billion a year directly on national forest recreation. So there's an economic benefit to healthy forests as well. And I guess what you're all saying is, is uh very similar to what we're learning about wetlands and the protection that the wetlands afford uh, cities like uh, New Orleans uh, or, um, or Houston or uh, coastal cities in which those wetlands act as a buffer during hurricane season. And when you remove the wetlands and you pave over uh, too much, you end up with massive flooding. And then we end up with population dislocation uh, like we saw during the Katrina catastrophe or as we see through successive years of flooding in Houston. Mary, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, you, you wanted to make a point. Well, I just wanted to pick up on um, something Ray said that I think that we forget. I think um, humans often think that nature just exists, but it's, it's green infrastructure as Ray and Marcus both pointed out. And like any infrastructure, nature needs to be maintained at times too. So there are things that we as humans can do to make our forests more resilient and um, continue to provide the benefits. But what we don't wanna do is get to the place where we're not paying enough attention and losing our forests because then issues start to cascade in a negative way. Do we have to start looking at these ecosystems a little bit like we look at ourselves? You know, as, as we get older, we might get um, a, a pacemaker or we might get a hearing aid. Three of us on this program have glasses, right? So there's, they're, they're manufactured pieces. Uh, we receive medical care, right? Uh, but there's also the biologic system that is ourselves. And as, as we age, there's this sort of combination and that sort of makes a, a whole quality of life. And maybe the way we need to start thinking about our, our grasslands, our, um, our um, uh, wetlands, our forests, our oceans, as part of an entire system where there is no separation between the urban environment and the urban environment which consumes waters from the, from the Catskills, um, uh, right? Well, no, I just, it's interesting you mentioned grasslands, Mark, because, uh, and I know there's something near and dear to Mary's heart, uh, being a Midwesterner, we're, um, we're doing a lot of work at the Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie, which is only about 45 miles outside of Chicago. So one of the most urban areas in the country. And here's this 20,000 acre plot of land where um, when you're talking about things that like wearing glasses or, you know, thinking of it as a human body, things we need to do. This was an, an area that went from grassland in the 18th century to agriculture in the 19th century to an industrial landscape in the 20th century. We're now, with a lot of other partners, bringing it back to native grasslands. And those deep roots hold tons of carbon in the ground. 
And then another example would be out in the Shoshone National Forest um, in Wyoming, where after a really severe fire, the trees just weren't going to come back. There's not a lot of water out there like there is in my home state of Louisiana. Um, but you know, after 30 years, I think the Forest Service concluded we really need to replant. So that was very active, you know, intervention by with funding from the National Forest Foundation to plant 30, 40,000 trees to give that forest a chance to regenerate. So these are like, I guess, little surgical things. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about food supply as well. You know, here in this country, we went through a process in which we were an agriculturally based economy and we became an industrially based economy. And then as we grew, we needed to have industrial farming. Industrial farming is the thing that allows our population, our expanded population to be fed. Right? So it's not necessarily a bad thing. And we're all accustomed to seeing these nice fields, sometimes really massive, of monoculture uh, corn uh, or whatever. Um, it seems that, though, that we're now finding that that leaves real vulnerability in our food supply. Um, and as we eliminate and we become more efficient, we also become less resilient. Um, one of the questions that I have here is, what is the role of these natural habitats in assuring resilience? Um, and does biodiversity have a utility beyond the philosophical, All right? So Marcus, do you, do you mind uh, dealing with that? Yeah, you bet. Um, so I think, it's, it's a great question and it's a great point. And I think you're absolutely right that biodiversity does have um, value beyond the sake of biodiversity. As we've been talking about, these are complex natural ecosystems. Uh, we understand a bit about them and there's a lot we don't understand about how they operate. And, and we've shown in the past with some of our management decisions, how little we understand about them. Um, we're getting, we're getting smarter every year. We're making better management decisions every year. But what we're realizing is that the ecological processes that are there um, are some of the most resilient processes that we have. And so what we need to do is manage for as much biodiversity as possible because we don't know the effect of limiting that. And if we have that biodiversity, we're gonna have a more stable, more resilient ecosystem. These ecosystems, have been around for thousands, um, probably you know, thousands and thousands of years. And they've persisted and they've been stable and they've been resilient. When we're starting to see them change is when we intervene by limiting biodiversity, limiting processes that would naturally occur. If we let them occur, it will find a balance again. And what we're seeing in our forest management now is moving towards more of that natural process. So we're not trying to manage forests anymore in a type of monoculture that you mentioned with like full food and agriculture. We're trying to set them back on a natural trajectory and reintroduce natural processes that will make them more resilient. And to do that, we need biodiversity. What's interesting is we just completed a poll in which the respondents um, uh, seem to agree with you that the biggest benefit of having open public land is to promote biodiversity and conservation um, with non-commercial uh, use um, also gaining a lot of support. I, I guess one of the questions that I have is why we're not paying attention to human history. You know, if you take a look at what happened when the Greeks denuded uh, the, the, uh, the, those areas of Greece, uh, forests, you had uh, previously navigable uh, channels uh, silted up through erosion, which uh, you pointed to uh, Marcus, you had, uh, because trees had been cut, they would not regrow. Um, the climate uh, actually changed. And um, a, a lot of those uh, communities ended up uh, becoming wanderers because the land would no longer sustain them. So the real question becomes, uh, and, and we can see that in, in Appalachia, which, uh, not Appalachia, in the Adirondacks in New York, where uh, clear cutting had, uh, had uh, destroyed um, once thriving communities that, that had relied on the, uh, the steel industry. Um, you know, the real question becomes, how do we move forward? Can we actually repair or are we on a trajectory in which um, 
our own self-interest is is uh, going to lead us to uh, to take action which which harm us. I mean, I think you you bring up some great history, Mark, but uh, I think we are learning. We just sometimes are a little slow. So I'll point out that the national forests and grasslands were created because of learning from places like Greece and what we did to the east as uh, European settlers started coming through. And so um, Gifford Pinchot and uh, President Roosevelt realized that we need forests in order to supply water and have timber and have settlements. So we do eventually learn. I think what the learnings that we're having right now is the Forest Service became so effective at suppressing fires because they thought all fires were bad. And yet before, when the Native Americans were here, they lit fires all the time to promote food and safety and wildlife habitat. So we, we have finally learned and are learning we need more fire on the landscape, but good fire like the Native Americans did. And we, we have to speed up taking some of the biomass, some of the trees off the forest before we can introduce good fire, but I'm, I think we're on the right trajectory. Mark, can I, I add to that? One, one of the, the, probably the biggest challenges for natural resource managers in the Forest Service today is that we can't, we can't necessarily mimic or go back to exact natural processes because there's a balance now. Because we utilize our forests and we live in our forests, in a way that we can't do what nature originally did. We can't have fire at the scale that might have burned naturally because people don't want the smoke. They don't want the fire that close to their home. Um, we have recreation and, for, and other infrastructure in our forests that allow that affect how we manage it. So there is always a, a push and pull of natural processes that we know are resilient that we want to reintroduce to our forests, but also how we use them and how we've grown accustomed to having these lands around us. I would just add that those are great points. I would just add that um, we also see real progress in, in maybe some unexpected ways. Um, so even though we're not an advocacy group, we're not lobbying and litigating, we're doing a lot of work on the ground and we're seeing not only volunteers coming forward and making a change, but corporations um, increasingly recognizing how intertwined the health of our environment is with their profitability and the importance it carries with their employees. And so, you know, we're, I mean, we got a, a tremendous source of support from the VF Corporation to create this front range strike team in Colorado to get volunteers out to do trail maintenance. You know, partners like REI are we're planting a million trees with REI. Uh, their customers are out there, you know, enjoying national forest. And companies are, are increasingly discovering these public lands are, they're in great need, they're in huge need. I mean, the estimates of the number of acres uh, of the national forest system that need some kind of restoration, 70 million, 75, 80 million, those are huge numbers. But there are lots and lots of local groups, national groups like the NFF who are digging into this and you know, collectively making a big difference. And, and the poll that we just completed um, indicates that everybody believes that, that the forests and open grasslands are important to our environment. My, my biggest concern, though, is that um, we live in, a, in our own micro bubbles. I do. Each of you do. And whatever we, uh, we perceive is the, are, are the things that we come into contact with the people we come into contact with, the, po the positive reinforcement that we receive. Yet year after year, decade after decade, century after century, there is an erosion of these natural habitats. And the question ends up becoming, to what extent can we, um, we uh, tamp down our own self selfish interest to, um, to instead advocate for a communal one? Um, do you believe that that part of this is a matter of, of creating a different value set, um, almost in the same way that religious movements have, right? Where you, where you start identifying your own behavior with the other and deciding, deciding that we're not going to be the consumers that we were, deciding that the convenience of buying a, you know, a a uh, cardboard box 
in which are a whole bunch of plastic bags that you can easily slip uh, sandwiches in or, or food into and, and ending up with, with this huge amount of, of plastic that maybe that kind of convenience we're not going to do. And instead we're going to get glass and you know a screw top lid and we're going to reuse that and wash it and, and so on. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of have to really change ourselves in ways that we've never really had to. Well, Mark, I, I agree. I think we also have to kind of change um, our understanding of how our beliefs and habits get sort of calcified. You know, for 50 years now, who have been some of the most vocal champions and advocates for sustainable practices? It's been our children. It's been younger people who have pushed adults to think about the future. We have children, they do it all the time. It's not just the recycling bin in the kitchen, but you know, thinking about how much we drive. We've got friends who just as a, as a family, they sat down together and their kids said, we wanna make our household carbon neutral. So I do think though, I mean, there you've got a little bit, I won't say a clash of values, but you've got um, some idealistic values of younger people who are trying to kind of push that up into those of us who become older and who maybe lose some of that idealism. So I think that's a, and we're seeing it currently in the climate change debate. I mean, younger, consistently, younger people are this source of energy for more sustainable practices. Could you all talk about your, your views of, of how different actors here on an individual basis, um, on a business basis, on a government basis, how, they, how this needs to, to evolve. You know, you do have in this country these incredible debates about uh, coercion, uh, government control, regulation, all these different aspects. And then there's the education piece uh, where people are saying that one side or the other is indoctrinating. We're either being educated to be natural consumers or educating to be educated to be conservationists and so on. Everything seems to be political. How do we navigate this space so that we end up with a, a better environment um, in, in terms of, of our human interactions that result in a more sustainable ecosystem that protects national uh, forests, protects grasslands? How do we do that? How do we, how do we reach across different perspectives? So Mark, that's a great question, and I have kind of a twofold response. One, um, if if there is any such thing as a silver lining or an upside to a pandemic, part of it is that a broader segment of the public now understands better understands the importance of nature. It has been the solace for many to be able to get outside and do something uh, that they've never done before. So. Uh, RV sales are through the roof. Boats you can't find anymore. Bikes are, are a year behind in, in manufacture. So, so people are beginning to understand better the value of nature. And let's hope that continues. So I think from uh, on the education side, I, I can only go back to how I learn best. And I learn best always by being shown something new and be able to touch it and feel it and understand it for myself. So part of our mission is to really engage the American public in that enjoyment and stewardship of the national forest system. And it's a, it's a long battle because it's hard to engage everybody, but every time you get one more new voice and passionate person involved, we're on the uphill side. So that was interesting. Uh, uh, Marcus, I'll, I'll come back to you in a second. I just wanted to announce the result of the third poll, which is interesting because we, we asked how, many, how often people visited the, um, the national forests. Uh, over half said annually. Um, once a month was about 10%. And then every few years and, and rarely got about 40% uh, of the vote, actually 36% of the vote. What you're saying, Mary, is that exposure is really important, right? Education is really important. Marcus, why, why don't you go on? Well, I was just going to, you know, in my mind, there's a spectrum of, of how people can engage. And so what Mary was talking about with folks getting out during the pandemic and just getting out and building that love and appreciation for National Forests is the, the first engagement point. 
And then there's engagement points beyond that, that that we hope build from that. So, you know, one of the great things about public lands is one of those points in the spectrum is, is a feeling of ownership and responsibility because everyone can participate in how public lands are managed. Every major decision on public lands goes through a public engagement process where you can voice your opinion, you can comment on it, and you can learn what others are, what others are thinking about how our land should be managed too. So that's that's another step. And then there's you know a step beyond that that once you have that love and you have that ownership, hopefully you do become an advocate or an educator to help others understand how they can take care of their land as well too. And and you know what we hope everybody gets to selfishly at National Forest Foundation is wanting to then give support to help their public lands. Um, after they have that love, they have that ownership, they're advocating, then they can financially support it. And that's what we're here for is to help them do proactive work on our national forests. I think part of what you all are saying is that we no longer have the luxury. It's sort of like the ecosystem argument, right? We can't see the forest separate from the cities. That was the big, that was, you know, what, when you, uh, when you Marcus uh, talked about, you know, erosion of roads, because in the aftermath of fires, you have rains that then strip the soil. And then all of a sudden you find roadbeds that are running through these, these areas undermined, right? I mean, there, there is a direct connection between how we live in cities and how, how uh, our forests are, are preserved. In the same way, we as organizations can no longer just be purely advocacy or purely planting trees or purely this or purely that. Part of this is to galvanize, it's, it's basically um, galvanize knowledge and communicate with each other. So is part of your work to talk with people who are completely in a different space um, might not see things the way you do, might oppose some of the things that you do as part of your responsibility to engage with, with people and, and try and convince, um, try to share, try to be informed by their perspective. Uh, Ray, I see you nodding uh, vigorously. I care to elucidate? I, I mean, I, I love this idea that you're raising, Mark, about overcoming barriers. For more than a dozen years now, the National Forest Foundation has been running a really effective program called Conservation Connect that is exactly what you're talking about. It's literally to bring together around the table, metaphorically and, and literally, representatives of very, very divergent viewpoints. So you've got motorized recreation, timber interest, environmentalists, quiet recreation, local business, water quality experts. So everyone sees the forest through their own lens. Everyone sees the forest as something where they can maybe extract or give back or enjoy or share with others. But our job as a, as a nonpartisan, uh, non-advocate group is to find that common ground. And it's amazing with enough time, and these, these processes do take real time, those barriers can come down because while people may have lots of different positions, they often have shared interest. And that is a healthy forest. And, and that's a powerful thing. Marcus, let's go to you, and then Mary, we'll, we'll end up with you. We're coming to the end of our time. Uh, Marcus, how, how do you see this, this interaction between partners, uh, people who are sitting on the other side of this proverbial table? Um, how do you see creating the change in America that results in forests that are growing as opposed to diminishing? Well, I, I mean, I... I think Ray said it well, is that everyone, everyone recognizes this value of a healthy forest. And we all need to recognize that value for, of a healthy forest, no matter where you're coming to it from, whatever lens you're looking through. Uh, they, have to, they have to take that, that individual vision, put it together into a shared vision and let science guide it. Um, we have a lot of great science. The, the US Forest Service knows more about forests and, and the science of forests than any other entity in the world. Let's take that information, let's take individual visions and put it together to manage the lands the best we can. And the, the only thing, if we can do that, the only thing we're lacking then is potentially the resources to get it done. And that's when everybody can come together when they have that shared vision and support it financially um, with their in-kind efforts to get done what needs to be done on the landscape. 
And Mary, do you see us in a conservation game or in an expansion game going forward? Do you see a day when our forests actually increase acreage? As a nation, yes, I wouldn't say as the national forests, right? That, 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 those 193 million acres are pretty set. They might expand a little, but yes, I think there, there's a big movement afoot now that, um, that is really beginning to understand the importance of forests. And so private landowners are getting involved, state and local government is getting involved as well as the national level. So yes, I think that, that again, we're on that upward trend that will gain more forests back. A very optimistic note on which to end. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and, and the work of the National Forest Foundation. Mary Mitzos, Ray Foote, Marcus uh, Selig, thank you so much for the work of your staff, your volunteers, your board members, your funders. That's the nonprofit report, everyone. Thank you, attendees, for coming and sharing your questions with us. And we'll see you again next Tuesday.